Welcome to chapter 3 of the King's Indian Masterclass. We're discussing 9 Knight D2. This is a move that has largely gone out of fashion, but I think it's still worthwhile to take a look at it because, first of all, it's still playable, but secondly, it's very similar to the other classical lines with Knight E1 or B4, where fundamentally white goes for the same idea of a queenside attack and black goes and returns with a kingside attack. So I think the ideas are very much applicable in some of the other classical variations and games that you might get. Additionally, with the Knight D2 variation, there are some very stunning games, and especially one by Hikaru Nakamura. It's many times been considered the best game of the King's Indian. Many people think it's Hikaru Nakamura's best game. It's a very nice immortal game, so we'll take a look at that one too. As always, I'll be including a PGN file of everything that we discuss in the description below. Additionally, this video will go through three Grandmaster top-level games that will really cement some of the ideas and the ways that you navigate these positions. So let's begin by talking about some of the basic ideas and properties of the move Knight to D2. One of the first things that you should notice is that the Knight is now more directly in the Queen side and supporting a Queen side expansion, but in exchange, white is very slow to develop this uh, bishop here on c1. They don't have the ability to put it on e3 and f2. They also, unlike knight e1, where sometimes the knight comes to f2, they won't put the knight on f2 either. And so often they'll play f3, but there won't be a piece on f2 which will help defend over here on the king side. So our attack tends to be a bit more powerful, but at the same time, their attack on the queen side is also very powerful because often the bishop comes in these cases to a3. This is almost exclusively where it develops, where it's a very strong piece along this diagonal supporting b4 and c5. So in this position, we're going to play knight e8. Now, you can also go knight d7, and these will likely transpose because the next move is f5 and knight f6. So knight e8 I'm going for simply for the reason that in the day database that I was looking at, the most illustrative games were played with knight e8, so I want to show those games, so I think I'll, I'll recommend knight e8, but knight d7, again, very similar, and, and almost, you know, practically no distinction, because again, it's going to transpose. Now here, the move b4 is what we'll begin by looking at. One other thing I want to make clear, unlike the other variations of knight e1 or b4, where it's a little bit more critical, you have to memorize the exact move orders, here, because the bishop is blocked, there is less um, time pressure, right? Like it's not the bishop that's gonna be racing to come to f2 before we lock it out of the game with f4. So there's less time pressure. So white can really go about the attack in numerous different ways. They can go b4, they can go rook b1. In theory, they can go a4 first. So there aren't as many differences or distinctions with the specific move orders you're gonna see. It's likely going to transpose we're going to begin by looking at b4, then we'll look at rick b1, but fundamentally and practically they're very similar. So f5, c5, we go knight to f6. We're putting pressure on e4, which is good because now we're encouraging f3, and the second you see f3, you go f4. As a reminder, I usually don't recommend going for the premature f4 before you see f3, because this gives white the flexibility to either go g3 or h3 and really not play the move f3. When you first put pressure on the pawn in the center, encouraging f3, because although the pawn is defended for now, if they want to eventually continue and make progress on the queen side, they're going to have to move the knight and hang the pawn. So f3 is a move that is highly encouraged, and now we go f4. We continue with knight to c4. We go g5. We're obviously heading towards g4. So the move a4 is played. We have knight to g6. And here, the move bishop a3, like I said, the bishop coming to this diagonal, and because the bishop ends up coming to this diagonal in these variations, it is especially important to not forget the maneuver of rook f7, bishop f8. This is very powerful in the other 91 lines, but especially here, rook f7 defending over the 7th rank and preparing to combat the control that white has along this a3 to f8 diagonal. So bishop f8, very important move to end up playing in these variations. Now we have the move b5 here, uh, black decided to take, bishop takes, and h5, going for g4. The idea is quite obvious. I want to say something about this move here. Why did black decide to take? Do, don't we usually kind of ignore the attack and just focus solely on our attack? Well, true, but generally speaking, if you have the ability to take and there's something concrete that you're going for, then sometimes it's useful to throw that in because you're not wasting time because you're capturing, so you're not losing tempo. And additionally, with taking, the important thing to understand 
is that you're getting rid of some of the attacking ideas that white has, namely b6, and also eventually when you play bishop to f8, you're immediately putting a, pressure, a question to these bishops, and if the bishops get traded, that's great for black because a lot of the pressure now also gets you know diminished when the bishops leave the board and black now has a far you know easier time generating play and and less counterplay uh, for white basically. So that's sort of the idea with taking bishop takes h5, g4, g3. Again, you go for these attacks. This is kind of what makes the king's indian so fun. King to h1, and again, bishop f8, this is kind of the move that's important to play at some point to contest this bishop here. Now, in the game, the move d6 was played, and here black decided to take, and once again, the reason that you're kind of justified in taking here is because, first of all, it's a capture, so you're not losing tempo, and second of all, that, se that second criteria that's important to meet is that there's something very specific that you're going for. And here, it's the fact that the pawn doesn't really want to take because then we can trade rooks. And in the resulting position, again, a lot of the pressure is gone now that the rooks are gone. And black has an easier time to focus on playing on the king side, which is going to be, you know, uncontested on the queen side. So bishop f8, black took. This is Hikaru Nakamura against Boris Gelfand, one of the most famous games. This is the, the beautiful game that I was mentioning earlier on, knight h4, and you begin to see it here, knight takes g2. The point is that if the king were to take, the king is now extremely exposed, and after the very simple rook to g7, there is just too much pressure to handle. We're threatening to take and then get a queen to h4. Uh, the king can't really run. I mean, this is one of those situations, for example, if they were to take, we can go queen to e7 or queen e8, ultimately, we're going to move this knight away, in some cases, maybe capture, we're threatening to capture and then bring the queen in once the knight is gone, uh, there's ideas of sacrificing the bishop to get the queen, there's a lot of different ways to play this sort of position, but as it turns out, the king is far too exposed and black is, is doing very well. So after knight g2, white first took on c7, but this in fact is even worse, because they missed knight takes e1, threatening mate, so you cannot take the queen, and this is sort of where the beauty of the game begins, where black gives away their queen in theory, but you obviously cannot capture it because of mate, and what you'll see is that they continue to give away their queen. Bishop h3, again, you can take the queen, not really, because bishop g2 is mate. Bishop to f1, again, queen d3, you can take the queen, not really, bishop g2 is still mate, and very nicely, bishop to h3, also allows this mate here. So very nice games, basically. Uh, you can see that, you know, black gets a lot of play with the queen, knight to e5, and a final queen sacrifice with bishop f1. You can take the queen, not really, bishop g2, checkmate. So I think this is kind of the, the thematic attack that you end up seeing where the queen you know, is sacrificed many, many times. In the resulting position, we don't get mate, uh, surprisingly, but we get a position where the, the board has very much clarified and black is up a ton of material. Even after giving away the rook, they're up uh, an entire piece worth of material. So white decided to resign here and the game ended. So a very nice illustrative game. You can see kind of the balance of playing on the queen side with inserting the captures on c5 and b6 but while doing that simultaneously making huge progress and headway on the king side and ending off with some very stunning sacrifices to seal the game over. So that was the first game. I'm going to now look at a second game, which will begin with the move 15 rook to f7. And here instead of b5, which is what the first game covered, we're looking at a5. But as you'll see, the moves basically transpose because white goes for b5 on the very next move. Because again, this is the only way that white gets play in these sort of structures, they have to go for this attack viciously because otherwise we're going to run them over on the king side. So we take again on c5, you can see the same fundamental idea where the second the pawn moves and no longer defends, we're justified to take because we can immediately, if they were to capture, contest this bishop with bishop to f8 and we're doing very fine again in these resulting positions where the bishops get traded. So the move b6 was played with the intention that if we were to take, then the sacrifice kind of pays off after queen to b3, the knight is coming in, the bishop can then capture on c5, white is making huge progress, and our attack is not as close as we need it to be. So going back, rather than taking, uh, black evaluated this and decided to just continue with their attack with g4. We have captures, captures, knight b5, 
one of the important properties of playing the King's Indian is that you cannot be materialistic. You need to focus on initiative and attacking and pressure far more than simply counting the amount of pieces. And this is a good example because here g3 was played. And after knight takes on c7, taking the exchange, don't even capture back, knight takes e4, going for this crazy variation. You want to now bring the queen over to h4. You're not even capturing. There's, you know, so much chaos going on the board. Now, admittedly, white had a very sneaky and very powerful move here, queen to c2, super unnatural. You're not taking the knight, you're not taking the rook, but both of those are not so good. If you take the rook, then queen h4 is in fact winning after h3, the bishop h3, and there's no way to stop mate. I mean, you have to go rook f2, but okay, this is mate as well. So if we go back, uh, they can't take the pawn here. Uh, they can't take with the pawn the knight, but queen h4. And it's a simple, similar idea. Admittedly, it's not as effective this time because the king does have a way to try to escape. But we can kind of stop that with queen to g3 or h4. The king is trapped. We have ideas of f3. We have ideas of bringing the rook in. We have ideas of bringing the knight in. Practically, we're doing pretty good here, even though objectively white can definitely hold. And in fact, the computer liked white in that position. But in this position, after knight takes, white made a pretty big mistake. They went knight to e6, but now after takes, takes, we have takes on h2 with check, king takes, and queen to h4, and the attack begins to form around this king. The king moves, knight to g3. Now the idea of queen to h1 is always in the air, so whenever the time is right, you will see that happen. The time is right, by the way, when after queen h1, we have a follow-up for king to f2, namely this move e3 is what we want to prepare. So you'll end up seeing the move e4 now with the idea of eventually going queen h1 and e3 check. We first have rook to c8 and a very nice move here, b5. Super nice because it's a fork and it's a very surprising one because it seems like they can just take that one, but they can't because now the bishop is cut from this diagonal. So bishop d4, check this out. Very nice mate in the end with knight e2. So we go back b5, white is forced into giving away the piece, but now queen h1, the time is right, we have e3, and the king eventually will just be completely trapped. Now material is equal, but black is, you know, almost checkmating here. There's really zero ways to avoid this attack. The king is completely stranded in the center. After king e2, for example, the simple rook to c3 will secure the victory. Queen e3 is a mate threat. Uh, rook e4. Uh, it fails to the very nice knight f4, giving away the knight, distracting the rook from the defense of the mate. So a nice ending to this game as well. I think you see some very thematic ideas here as well, where you sacrifice the knight with the intention of opening up the diagonal for the queen to come as soon as possible, which is super thematic in these sort of positions, especially when the pawn reaches g3. You want to put as much pressure on h2. You also, by the way, there saw the idea of sacrificing the bishop on h3, which is one of the main purposes of the bishop in these sort of positions. So keeping that in mind, the idea that you can take away the bishop by playing bishop takes h3 to completely blast open the position. It's a pretty useful sacrifice to know. The final game I want to look at begins after rook b1. Now, as I mentioned, rook b1 versus b4, it's not very significant, these different move orders. And in fact, you'll see almost the identical position arrive on the board with g5, with f4, the knight coming to g6, bishop coming to a3 after a4, bishop a3, rook f7, bishop f8. I mean, this is an identical plan to the both of the games that we saw. So what's kind of the important concept of this game? What makes this unique? Well, that will be revealed very shortly. One thing that I want to emphasize here, you can continue very consistently by taking here, like I've talked about previously. This is a fine option for black. Black decided to kind of bend the rules a little here and play a queenside move that is not capturing, which is to go b6. Now, they're a grandmaster. They know when to kind of break the principle. And as this turns out, b6 is the best move because you restrict the play a little. This is not one that's so unnatural and I think uh, quite natural to, to find on the board. b6 is, is a nice way to slow down the attack. Now, the game continued with the knight coming to a2, and this is the important moment that I want to pause on. One of the key concepts that I mentioned in the beginning of the video with the move 9, knight to d2, is that no piece ends up taking over the f2 square. No bishop with bishop e3, bishop f2, and no knight with knight e1, knight d3, knight f2. Therefore, white is lacking in defenses on the king side in these very positions. And especially with knight a2, bringing out another piece away from the center, 
we are prepared to launch the attack and we don't need to prepare it with h5. So because white completely prioritized queenside play and in many ways abandoned the kingside, we are justified to just go for the immediate g4. We do not have to prepare it with h5, g4, which is possible, but g4 is, is completely fine here again because of the idea that white does not have the proper defenses. So this is another very important distinction with knight to d2. White ends up lacking defense on the king side, which, as you'll see, really comes to hurt them in this position. And this is, in my opinion, one of the main reasons why this variation of knight d2 has gone out of fashion. White doesn't have the sufficient resources to defend this huge king side attack. So knight to, knight to h4, opening up the rook, threatening to take on g4. The knight takes on g4 in the next move. Now again, we see black complementing the king side attack by playing a little on the queen side, grabbing some squares, controlling some files on the queen side. The most effective King's Indian play is a balance of queen side defense and king side attack. And so you often can kind of rely on the king side attack to take you the entire way and you can kind of forget or ignore the queen side pressure. But often it's also in your best interest to consider various captures or some moves on the queen side that can help with your king side attack. And this is a great illustration because it allows from some spectacular tactics like knight h2, where now the bishop is under attack with a fork and there's the pressure on the c file. You combine both of the ideas, also noticing the potential mating idea, and that gives you rook to c4 here. And after rook takes, knight f3, checkmate. Very nice attack. Now, obviously, white saw this, they went rook to c1, but it's already basically game over because queen h4, rook to e4, and we're up so much material, but even more importantly, I would argue, we have such a huge dominant position. Look at every single piece here. Compare the rooks to the opposing rooks. Compare our queen to the counterpart queen. We have the two bishops. I mean, this is really very difficult to defend from, and that becomes very clear when you see the idea of going f3, you then go queen to h3, rook to g2 is now an unstoppable mate threat. For example, after rook d7, rook g2. This is mate, and this is mate as well. So black resigned a couple moves ago after the move queen to h3. So as a quick overview of knight to d2, Generally speaking, there's nothing specific about this move. There's no real main setup, but some pointers are that white goes for the queenside attack, the bishop comes to a3, the knight comes to c4, white largely abandons their kingside defense, and therefore we are justified to very brutally, even more so than in the 91 lines, go for this kingside push f5, f4, g5, knight g6, and sometimes we don't even need to, to waste time with h5. There is always the importance of going rook f7, bishop f8, which is amplified in these variations because of the added pressure along this diagonal, so do not forget this maneuver. Don't be afraid to play a little on the queen side. Generally speaking, that comes in the form of captures where you don't lose tempo and you have something specific to gain, but in general, mixing your king side attack with some small queen side improvements for defense is a useful way, a useful uh, sort of potion for success. Hopefully you guys enjoyed this video. Make sure you subscribe if you're new around here, like this video if you learned something new from it, and I'll see you guys next time. Peace out.